share the session. Well, so for the first speaker today, we have an outside speaker and very happy that the organizers got David Tong here from Cambridge. I think these days David spends most of his time making Landau Lifshitz irrelevant by writing a 10-book series on all of physics. But <laughs> nevertheless, he found enough time to come here and tell us about scattering things of monopoles. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, firstly, uh, a huge thanks to the organizers, to Ashwin, to Mike, to Juji, to, uh, to, to Ruben for shipping me over to Boston. Um, something that Ashvin said resonated, actually, because Ashvin and I were batchmates together. We were Papalado fellows at MIT 20 years ago, and I could sort of tell he was doing interesting stuff. You were working on deconfined criticality, and I sort of could tell it had something to do with things I would be interested in, but there wasn't really the communication. So I think conferences like this, which are increasingly common, uh, have been extremely useful for, as Ashvin said, bringing different communities together. Um, I, I'm going to tell you uh, about something I've been confused about for many, many years. Um, as will become clear towards the end of the talk, I remain confused about this topic, but I'm less confused than I was a year ago. So I want to share with you um, the progress that I think we've made uh, in, in the last year in this, uh, in, in this topic. So the, the general question, and I'm going to spend the first uh, 15 minutes of the talk spelling this out in detail, the general question is the following. Uh, you take a chiral gauge theory in four dimensions. Chiral gauge theory, of course, means left-handed and right-handed fermions experience different forces. And in the chiral gauge theory, you put a magnetic monopole. So th this could be a Dirac monopole, some singular object. It could be a toft polyakov monopole, some, some soliton. But there's a magnetic monopole. And the question is, what happens when you throw a fermion at the magnetic monopole? And the problem that was highlighted 40 years ago is that there seems to be a paradox in any chiral gauge theory, including, and this is important, the standard model, the, the world that we live in. And the paradox comes about in the following way. Um, the chirality in four dimensions, which means left-handed and right-handed fermions have different quantum numbers, translates to a kind of chirality in a two-dimensional sense. Because when you look at the partial waves, the ingoing modes of the fermions carry different quantum numbers from the outgoing modes, in a way that I will spell out in the first part of this talk. And so the question becomes, if you throw in a particular fermion with certain quantum numbers, what can come out? So what single particle state or multi-particle state can come out that shares the same quantum numbers as the thing you threw in? And the problem is that it appears that there are no outgoing states that carry the right quantum numbers, including in the standard model. So uh, that's very, very confusing. Uh, it's been a problem for um, almost 40 years, as I will, uh, I, I will show you. So what I'd like to do is, is largely in this talk spell out the problem uh, for you, and then in the second part of the talk tell you about some progress that um, I think we've made. I, I would say it's maybe it's a resolution, may, maybe it's a path towards a resolution. But it was a paper from a couple of months ago with some wonderful collaborators. Uh, so these are Marika and Diego, who are both in Stony Brook, uh, together with Zohar, and Philip, who used to be my PhD student and is now in IPMU. Um, there should be another follow-up paper within the next, uh, next month or so. All right, so um, let me just tell you the puzzle in, in slightly more detail. Um, it was first pointed out by Callan in 1984 in the context of the standard model. Uh, the standard model is not the simplest context in which to explain this, but this is where it first appeared. Um, and it's, uh, it's the following. Suppose that we actually discover a magnetic monopole in our world. It's not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, throw an electron at it. Now, uh, the puzzle comes when you're at sort of reasonably high energies. You should ignore confinement. So think about the quarks being free because you're at short distances. And you should ignore electroweak symmetry breaking. So you should be at distances smaller than an inverse TeV scale where the, all the fermions are more or less massless. And uh, Callan showed that if you send in a right-handed fermion, there's a unique linear combination of outgoing modes that have the same quantum numbers. And uh, I've written them here. Uh, the U's are up quarks. The Q is the doublet of up and down quarks, the left-handed doublet. And the L is the uh, a doublet of leptons. Um, if you're not a particle physicist, roughly speaking, he showed that if you throw in an electron, the only thing that can come out consistent with all quantum numbers of the standard model is uh, a half antiproton plus electron, roughly speaking. Hello. Yeah. So 
Good. It, it's, it's so, a David, you, you'll have to repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, what, what's the Dirac monopole? It, it's the Dirac monopole that has minimum quantization with respect to the electron under electromagnetism. Now, now, that means naively it appears that it does not have good Dirac quantization with respect to the quarks that carry fractional electric charge. So this monopole also has to ca color magnet carry magnetic charge in the SU3, and it turns out in the SU2. So in some sense, it's the minimal mag magnetic monopole, but it carries magnetic charge in all three of the gauge loops of the standard model. Yeah. All right, so, so this is uh, what Callan showed. Uh, the problem is that, that this conclusion makes no sense at all. And it makes no sense because there's a factor of a half there. And it doesn't make sense to throw in an electron and get half an antiproton and, uh, and half an electron. It's, it's complete nonsense. And yet, there's no other state that you can put on the right-hand side with integer numbers in front of the particles, as they should be, that, that carries the right charge. That was the puzzle that Callan set 40 years ago. It's a bit weird. It went under the radar for many, many years. I, I learned about it maybe five years ago. And in recent years, there's been a succession of papers. I think people have maybe got the tools to be interested in it or... I don't, know, I don't know why, but, but finally, there, there's uh, um, the community, I think, has come to realize that this is an important problem. All right, so I'm not going to tell you about the standard model. What I'm going to do is tell you about a succession of toy models, partly to illustrate the problem uh, more clearly, and then secondly, to show you, show you how we can go towards solving this, this problem. All right, so um, the first toy model I want to tell you about is very simple and also very wrong. Uh, the toy model is a U1 gauge theory coupled to a single right-handed vial fermion in four dimensions. This is a theory that makes no sense whatsoever. As a gauge anomaly, it's a sick theory. What I'm going to do is simply show you a physical manifestation of the sickness. I'll, I'll set up a thought experiment where you can tell that, that the theory doesn't make any sense. Okay. Uh, so the thought experiment is the one that I just showed you. You put a magnetic monopole in the U1, and you throw this uh, vial fermion at the magnetic monopole, and you ask what, what bounces back. Okay. So you know how we do scattering. You have to take the field. You decompose it into partial waves. Yang told us how to do this in 1977, I think. Um, and you solve the Dirac equation in the presence of the monopole. And what you find is the following structure. So there is uh, a lowest angular momentum mode, which turns out to uh, be an S wave. It's slightly weird because fermions usually have spin a half, but there's an anomalous shift by a factor of a half because of the electric and, and magnetic charge. So the lowest angular momentum mode is an S wave, and then there's a series of higher angular momentum modes, J equals 1, J equals 2, and so on. The lowest angular momentum mode is special for two different reasons. So firstly, it's special because it's spin polarized. I guess I should say helicity Polarized. The, the lowest angular momentum mode only has an ingoing mode and does not have an outgoing mode. It, I think it's familiar to condensed matter physicists. It's the same statement that the lowest Landau level of graphene is spin polarized. It has half the degrees of freedom of the other one. Exactly the same physics that's, that's going on here. All right, so the, ingoing, the, the S wave has only an ingoing mode. Moreover, uh, the S wave um, does not experience an angular momentum barrier, whereas all the other modes do. So all the other modes come in pairs, and they don't really see the monopole. And they, they don't get near it. There's an angular momentum barrier, so they go in, and then they bounce back before they get to the, to the core of the monopole. The S wave, in contrast, goes all the way in, pierces the core of the monopole. And the question we want to ask is, what happens to the S wave when, once you throw it in? And the answer is, nothing happens. The theory is sick, and this is a manifestation that the theory is sick, because there's clearly nothing that can bounce back when, when the S-wave goes in. John? Oh, very, very good. If it's a static monopole and no gauge fields, it's a question of putting a boundary condition on the fermion, and a boundary condition which preserves the global U1 symmetry. Now, there's a folklore that you can only put boundary conditions for symmetries that themselves are not anomalous. It can be proven in certain circumstances, but uh, so, so that's what's going on. There's no boundary condition that preserves a global U1 in that case. Very good. It's a good, good question. Yeah. Other, other questions? All right. So, so this is a, a manifestation of the sickness of the theory. Um, but it's not hard to cook up similar problems for theories that, that aren't sick. So uh, here is uh, uh, 
uh, a simple generalization. You take U1, you take a bunch of bile fermions now with different charges that I'll call QI. And if you want the anomalies to vanish, the sum of the charges should vanish and the sum of the charge cubes should vanish. That's now a sensible theory, no gauge anomaly, no mixed gravitational gauge anomaly. And again, you can ask the question, what happens? So for each fermion, you do the same decomposition that, that, that you did before. Um, again, there's a lowest angular momentum mode that I'm going to call J0. The lowest angular momentum mode is not necessarily an S wave. It depends on the charge of the particles given by the following formula. There's a bunch of higher angular momentum modes as well. Again, the lowest angular momentum modes are special in two ways. Firstly, they're chiral. They either go in or they go out. And what determines whether they go in or out is the sign of the charge. And in addition, they do not feel an angular momentum barrier. Even though they're no longer an S wave, so they have angular momentum, there's no angular momentum barrier. So each of these lowest modes uh, goes to the core of the monopole where, where something happens. So again, you could ignore the higher ones. It's clear they're irrelevant for the problem. Uh, everything is to do with, uh, with the lowest modes. And you can tell that because the, the fermions have different charges, they don't come in plus minus pairs as they would in a vector-like theory, there'll be a bunch of different lowest angular momentum modes. Uh, some will go in and some will go out. That's guaranteed because the sum of the charges has to be zero. And so the question in general is you throw something in with a particular quantum number, how do you patch things together so that particles with different quantum numbers come out? Okay. So not that I know of. I would love it if there was. Oh, the question is is there an analogue in non relativistic quantum mechanics? Yeah, I don't I don't know. It would be brilliant if there were, but it, it seems very much to do with massless. Uh, fields. Therefore, relativity seems important. All right, here, here's the simplest example that this, it's not obvious, but I think this is the simplest chiral gauge theory in four dimensions. You have five vial fermions. They have charges 1, 5, minus 7, minus 8, and 9. The charges are uh, chosen because they sum to zero, and the cubes sum to zero. Okay, it's the simplest set of uh, uh, charges that, that have that property. Um, what it means is that the ingoing modes uh, carry quantum numbers under rotation. So there's an SU2 rotation that you want to preserve. There's the U1 charge. Um, what I've written here, you can see these, these two things are correlated. The, the bold letter is the dimension of the SU2 representation. The subscript is the charge under U1. Uh, the question is, if you throw in uh, one of these, or in fact, uh, any, either, any one of these, uh, some combination of these should come back. And the question is, what? Uh, and the answer is, we don't know. This remains an open problem. It's not something uh, that we're able to solve at the moment. Uh, we feel there should be a solution, I, I, I should stress. Notice that there's, um, there's 15 fermions going in. If you add these numbers together, there's 15 coming out. Uh, the two-dimensional anomalies for both this and this vanish in a two-dimensional sense. It's thought that there should be a boundary condition you could put on that, that uh, preserves these, these quantum numbers, these symmetries. No one knows how to construct it. So it's, a, it's an open question in this simple theory, um, what happens. Nonetheless, hopefully you can get an idea that, that, that the problem actually boils down to two-dimensional free fermions. I think we should understand two-dimensional free fermions. So what I'd like to do, how am I doing for time? Um, Ten minutes. All right. So, so what I'd like to do is uh, um, firstly tell you about a simple toy model in 2D that seems to have nothing to do with monopoles. We'll take some lessons from that, and then we'll go back and talk about monopoles. Subia. So what is the mystery? I mean, 159 go in and 78 come out. That's the answer? Or? Uh, no, no. So, so you want to throw all, th th this one in. You need some combination of these uh, so that they have this quantum number. So just one of them. Yeah. And then you throw this one. And you want some other combination of these. I, I'm a bit embarrassed because there's, there's a simple way to see that you can't possibly solve this. That, that, that there's something you throw in and there's a simple argument uh, about what comes out. And this morning I was trying to remember the simple argument and I can't. But you, you, you can't do it. I'll give you a clearer one on the next slide. All right, so, so here's a simple two-dimensional toy model that captures the spirit of the problem. It doesn't have anything to do with monopoles, but it captures the spirit of the problem. So I'm going to just take um, two-dimensional free fermions, two vial fermions going that way, and two vial fermions going that way. 
The two going that way have charges 3 and 4, and the two going that way have charges 5 and 0. And these numbers are chosen because 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared plus 0 squared, which guarantees the U1 anomaly in two dimensions vanishes. So now you can really see the problem. It, it's very clear. I put a wall here. The wall is the analog of the monopole. And I throw in a charge 3, and I ask, what bounces back? It's clear that there's nothing that can possibly bounce back. There's a 0 and a 5 are your, are your only options. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's clear that uh, nothing can bounce back. If you naively look for what bounces back, this is the same kind of calculation that, that, that Callan did um, uh, 40 years ago, then naively you find that what bounces back if you throw in a charge 3 is 3 fifths of a charge 5 and 4 fifths of a charge 0, and something similar if you throw in a charge 4. The, the fact that you need this charge 0 is, involves a second symmetry that I'm... Uh, I, I, I'm brushing under the rug. But, but these three-fifths and four-fifths are the analogue of Callan's a half. It doesn't seem to make any sense to have scattering in this theory. Nonetheless, um, it's entirely possible to construct boundary conditions that preserve uh, this U1 symmetry. Um, you go to the machinery of boundary conformal field theory. In boundary conformal field theory, there's an entire story about how you construct boundary conditions for fields, and uh, a few years ago, motivated entirely by this monopole problem, uh, uh, Philip and myself constructed boundary conditions that um, uh, preserve this symmetry. So you throw in a three, uh, and there's boundary conditions that preserve the symmetry with something, uh, something sensible bouncing back. So we constructed the boundary, the, the, the Cardi boundary state. We can computed the partition function, we computed all correlation functions, everything you want in this model is, is computable. But by the way, um, if I'm not messing things up, since my talk started, it was announced that Cardi won the breakthrough prize uh, this year. Um, I'm hoping it was announced, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think we're all thrilled that, uh, uh, that, that that's the case. With Zamologikov, I, I should add. Um, all right, so, so a few years ago, we constructed the, the, um, the boundary state. I'm not going to go into all the details. Following many, many other papers over, over many decades of people who, who did similar things. So as I said, we, we computed basically everything that you can compute in this, this, uh, uh, this theory. And yet, it was a little embarrassing giving talks, because I would give talks where I would compute everything and show all the details. And then someone would ask, but if you throw in a three, what bounces back? which is obviously the right question to ask, and I didn't have a good answer to that. I just somehow couldn't extract it from, from the mathematics. So what we did in the paper a couple of months ago was, was understand the answer to that simple question. What bounces back if you, if you throw in a three? Yeah, please. Yeah, right. so, so I wonder whether the function has to do with the SMG. It, it's very closely related. If you, if you uh, do symmetric mass generation over this side, it implements the boundary condition. Although I have to say, in a way that has not been fully fleshed out, but it, it, it must be related. Okay. That's sort of the question, is how, how do you interpret this three-fifths and four-fifths? I'll, I'll tell you the right answer. Yeah. All right, so, so what I want to do is tell you the answer. What bounces back if you throw a three, when all you've got going the other way is a zero and a five? Um, all right, this, this is the question. This is the charge three. You throw it in. What bounces back? Uh, the answer that we've come to over many, many years of, of confusions um, is that what bounces back is a charge three particle. even though there's no charge 3 particle in the spectrum. That, uh, I'll say it in the most dramatic way I know. Uh, the wall acts as a portal into a twisted sector of Hilbert space. And when you throw the particle at the wall, what bounces back is a particle that's not an excitation of your original Fox space, but is an excitation of a twisted Fox space, and that manifests itself in a topological line that joins the particle uh, to the wall. Or, or in the 4D case, this will be joining it to the monopole, as, as we'll see later. So, so let me tell you a little bit about what these, what these words mean. Um, the, the fractions that we saw, the three-fifths and the four-fifths, were hints 
that there was a Z5 global symmetry sitting in the game. This is what we missed uh, uh, until early, earlier this year. That there's an easier way to see this using bosonization, the, 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 the Z5 global symmetry, but I won't, uh, uh, I won't highlight that. So the Z5 global symmetry is a symmetry which doesn't act on the ingoing fermions, uh, but acts only on the outgoing fermions in the following way. This has charge 3, this has charge 4. And in the conformal field theory, there's a twist operator that I'll call T. And the twist operator is uh, defined by the fact that in Euclidean correlation functions, when you uh, insert a twist operator and you braid uh, the various fermions around, they pick up charges under this Z-fit symmetry. Moreover, this twist operator itself carries certain dimension and certain charge. Um, I have a story about how to compute the, uh, the charge and the dimension of this twist operator by using uh, the state operator map. Uh, these are the answers. I think, given that there's probably more interesting things to say, I'll, I'll push on. But there's a way to compute the charge of this twist, twist operator. So what you find um, when you throw in a charge 3 is what bounces back in equations is a charge 5 plus a charge 0 plus a twist operator. But when you compute the charge and dimension of this whole collection of things, you find that it has charge 3. The twist operator has a charge minus 2 that, that, that cancels this. But moreover, has dimension a half. So this combination of things that looks like a two-particle state is actually, for all intents and purposes, a one-particle state. It has the same dimension as a, as a single fermion. So th this is what I think is a very stark answer in, in this simple model. So let, let me sort of spell it out as, as clearly as I understand. Um, you're an experimenter in this little two-dimensional world, but you're an experimenter that's a long way away from the wall. And you can do lots of local experiments. You can compute the heat capacity in your world and figure out that there are two fermions going that way and two fermions going that way. And you can build little um, regions of uh, chemical potential to accelerate things. And you can figure out that the fermions going that way have charges 3 and 4, and the fermions going that way have charges 5 and 0. And you think you've understood everything there is about this, this world you live in. And then you do an experiment, which is just to throw a charge 3 particle that way and wait for a long time. And what you find is something entirely new and unexpected, that a charge 3 particle moves in the in the other direction. It's not a new field. It's not that there's a charge 3 field going that way. It's that you can access this twisted part of the, of the Hilda space. So um, it, it's for me, at least, it's a very surprising conclusion, but I think this is the right way to think about uh, this very simple model. When you look at the correlation functions that we computed some years ago in the partition function, they also carry this, this message. Ruben. I don't think there's any prevention to, 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 to measure it. There's a related question, which is, can you do an Aronoff-Bohm experiment to tell about the, the topological line that, that lives there, to tell it explicitly that it's in uh, another part of the Hilbert space? That, that's something I'm confused about. It, it's not obvious. If you think about in a space-time picture, particle goes in, and then it comes out uh, attached to a topological line. So it seems to split space-time in two, and you want something that braids around in Lorentzian space. I, I have some ideas. Zohar tells me they're wrong. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about, about the answer to that. Oh, sorry, the, the, the question is, you, you can't, it can't interfere with any, with any local, particle. local particle. You can measure the charge by putting on external things, chemical potentials and, and such like. Of course, the theory is a free theory, but I can deform it to be an interacting theory. Do you, there's a marginal operator in this CFT, obviously. But you, you think if that was the case, it would not interact with right-moving particles? Is that the same as not interacting? Okay, I, I, you know, I, I said at the beginning, I'm confused about these things, and this is one of the things I'm confused about. Can I ask about bosonization? I mean, I, yeah. I, my, my naive picture is it's a, it's a free 2D field theory, That's so right. I can bosonize the whole thing. Yeah. 
But in, to make the boundary requires interaction in some sense. Definitely. And the interaction, right. therefore, it's possible to create some kind of uh, fractionally charged soliton. And that's what that's, happens in both organizations. So yeah. I would think the soliton can interact perfectly well. Maybe it can't interfere, indeed, but I mean, it's still got oh, some I localized see. energy, in, in et cetera, if I were to try to. Thank put, you. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good argument. Yes. Yeah. Max. I, I don't know, but I can find out easily enough. Yeah, it, it's in our previous papers, the answer is. Um, all right. I, I'm going to push on, if, if, if that's okay, because I'd like to finish r roughly on time. So, so this is the story from, from the two-dimensional perspective. Um, it took me many, many years to come to terms with what seems to be a very simple conclusion, but nonetheless one that I find uh, very dramatic. Um, what's the lessons from monopole scattering? So, so now there's a clear program. You go to a four-dimensional gauge theory, you put in a monopole, you understand the lowest uh, angular momentum in going and outgoing states, and then you ask, can you solve it in the same way we solved this simple, simple toy model? Um, for many, you cannot, but for some, you can. It turns out, fortuitously, among those that you can are monopoles in the standard model itself. That's what the forthcoming paper is about, but um, for now, I'm just going to stick with uh, a rather simple um, uh, toy model. So the simple toy model is the following. It's a U1 gauge theory with two sets of N right-handed vial fermions where the, the vial fermions have opposite charges under the U1 but transform both in the fundamental of, of the SUN. And again, if you put in a monopole, there's the same kind of scattering paradox that, that we've seen. There's ingoing modes that transform in the fundamental of SUN with charge plus one. Outgoing modes in the fundamental with charge minus one. Naively, it seems that you can do scattering preserving either the SUN or the U1, but not both. One of them has to give. Uh, again, it turns out that's incorrect. You can find Cardi states uh, on the boundary that preserve, uh, preserve both. Um, the answer, uh, again, involves some symmetry. This time it's a ZN action that acts only on the right-handed guys, not on the sorry, the, the outgoing guys, not on the uh, ingoing guys. Uh, scattering again is you throw in a fermion with uh, psi, with certain quantum numbers. What bounces back is a fermion with exactly the same quantum numbers, even though naively no such fermion exists in the spectrum. It exists in the twisted uh, part of the Fox space. All right, so um, again, two-dimensional problem entirely solved. And then the question is, what does it mean for four dimensions? And here I'm um, less sure of the answer. So there's some obvious things that, uh, that it means. This is the 2D story, and we need to lift it up to some four-dimensional story. Everything is taking place in the S wave. So there's an S wave that goes in to, uh, to hit the monopole, and then there's an S wave that comes out. But that S wave that comes out is again in a twisted part of the Hilbert space with some... Uh, symmetry defect operator attached to it and correspondingly a topological surface that's attached to it. So you should think of this S wave that comes out. Obviously it's a, a two sphere around here. That's the, the outgoing uh, S wave. But the whole light cone has what was previously this topological string attached to it. So the topological string is co-dimension one, topological surface operator I should say. It, it's this two sphere plus uh, this light cone here. So anything that crosses this uh, picks up a Zn phase under, um, uh, 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 under this symmetry. All right, so um, that's sort of where we're at with understanding the scattering of fermions off monopoles, but it's not a great understanding. It's clear that these twist operators are important. It's clear that monopoles like uh, um, boundaries in two dimensions act as a portal into a twisted part of Hilbert space, which sounds like a brilliant thing for a science fiction movie. But the, the real question is, what does it mean? And I don't really understand what it means. Th there is surely an outgoing S wave in a twisted sector, but that's not the same as having an outgoing particle in a twisted sector. You know, particle detectors don't detect angular momentum eigenstates. They detect localised particles. So 
Is it possible that that S wave um, is the first part of an in entire set of twisted modes so that there are the wrong chirality particles in the spectrum that a particle detector could, could detect? <laughs> that, again, is a very dramatic conclusion. It's not one that I I'm sure is the right conclusion. Or is it somehow that you're restricted to the S wave and that it can't sort of crumble into, into more localized objects? That's also a very weird, dramatic conclusion. So, uh, as I said, we made progress. Personally, I'm still rather confused about what the, uh, um, uh, what the meaning of this twist operator is in, in the four-dimensional case. But there are lots of smart people in the audience, which is why I'm giving this talk and advertising my confusion. So I very much hope that uh, um, people who uh, understand what's going on can come to talk to me after this talk. But, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. We had plenty of questions, so maybe one more now. Uh, maybe we can take Shoot two. Yeah. So in 2D, in 2D um, you have a topological line. I mean, there isn't that much additional topological degrees of freedom you can add to a topological line. But in 4D, that topological surface, there are infinitely many uh, to additional topological degrees of freedom you can dress it with. So in an actual monopole scattering problem, do we have a clue what actually lives on the purple surface? Or maybe I, that's not a universal question to ask. Are you thinking of your ABJ defect operators in particular? Not necessarily. Even in the case of ZN, there could be additional stuff living on there, right? Oh, then you should tell me what that additional stuff is, and we, 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 could, we could figure okay. it out. Well, in the simplest case, you can add a decoupled TQFT on it, and you might not know whether it's really there in an actual dynamical setup. So as you know, for the higher charge monopoles, there was a Chern-Simons theory living on, on this. But that might not be unique. It right? might not be unique. It, it, it can be any Chern-Simons theory with the right anomaly. It, it can. I, I'll, I'll be honest, and that sort of smelled like additional complications over and above the most simple things, which is, which is precisely why I didn't mention it in this talk. Right. Um, so, so yes, but I have a feeling there's sort of zeroth order questions that we still don't understand. Maybe it's related. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I wonder what is the Fermian parity of that twist operator? So when you, when you, when you throw a Fermian in with a Fermian parity, well, all the Fermian parity, you know, some states with the same Fermian parity should, should, should come out, right? So I wonder what is the Fermian parity of the twist That's operator? Right. It depends from, from model to model. Uh, yeah, so it, 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 it varies depending on the... Uh, on, on the, the model. So in the 0345 case, I think it, had, it was odd under Fermi uh -huh. on parity. Um, in this SUN case, it's even under Fermi on parity. So I think it, it differs. It's something you have to compute, just as you have to compute the charge and dimension of it in, in each oh. case. Uh, I thought it has to be odd, though, because actually the Fermi parity has to conserve in this process. Uh, yeah, but in the 0345, you throw in one and two fermions come out coupled to a twist. Oh, okay. That's um, what I mean. So, sorry, so okay, that, that meant it was all okay, okay. but, but there's others where it's one to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, 